We're speaking with Michael Gayet, Portfolio Manager at Toroso Investments, and we're going to be talking about all things markets. Michael, it's your first time on Kitco News. Welcome to the show. Yeah, no, big, uh, big fan. I appreciate the invite here. Uh, big fan of your work as well. Michael, I, I've seen you on media all over the place. You're fantastic in talking about the markets. I only have one question for you to start off with. Are we going to see a market crash in April? Because I hear that from a lot of people who have come on the show. They specifically pointed out April as being the timeline for a major correction. Are we seeing that? Yeah, so a couple of things. The, um, I always make it a point to say that I don't know the exact mile marker that I might crash my car, which is April in that example, but I know the conditions that favor an accident. And I think a lot of the people that are making that case are somehow making the argument around taxes and the idea that, uh, you know, as you kind of reset the tax year, you're going to start seeing some some selling in advance of what could be some higher taxes down the line. Um, I do think that the conditions are starting to worsen, favoring some potential accident in the stock market. And I'm saying that from an objective standpoint in the sense that I track various leading indicators to volatility. Uh, and they're documented in these different award-winning white papers I published since 2014. And many of those indicators are starting to flash a warning signal, interestingly enough, around the time we enter April. Um, typically when these warning signs come up, if there is going to be a true decline it's within two to three weeks of the signals giving the warning. So we're actually getting pretty close to them flipping and, and suggesting risk off is coming. So maybe if something does end up happening in April. Uh, I would more take the, the approach that focus less on the crash idea and focus more on, well, what do you do in anticipation of what could be a more difficult juncture for risk assets? Okay, Michael, I want to talk about indicators and signals, very important for the markets. But first, I would like to comment on Janet Yellen's testimony with Congress this week. The stimulus package, the um, American Rescue Plan, was not funded with any increases in taxes, but um, a longer term plan uh, that addresses uh, critical really needs hasn't. in this economy probably would would be accompanied by some re revenue raisers. Revenue raisers, of course, she's referring to tax hikes. Now, the government is considering this. When will we get it? How likely are we going to get a tax hike? How significant would the tax hike be? And how would it impact investors? So look, I, I'm, I'm quite cynical about uh, the sheer amount of money there is in the system and sort of who is in control. Uh, I know tax hikes are coming. We all, I think, would agree on that. Uh, they're probably coming sooner than later. I don't think they're going to be anywhere near as severe as some of the more extremist elements uh, would like to see. But I think there's a, a, a bigger pushback here, which we're going to start seeing some, some rumblings about, which is that, okay, so you raise revenue through tax hikes, uh, but who cares if you're still spending at a faster pace? You know, I keep using this line on Twitter on at Lee Lag Report, if debt doesn't matter, then why are we paying taxes? And I think at some point that you know, sort of element of, of uh, discussion is going to come in there that will counter the notion of tax hikes somewhat, uh, unless there's some real meaningful spending cuts. And that's hard to see on the latter end. So I don't think it's going to be as, as, uh, as severe as some would think. Uh, but having said that, there is a much larger question from an economic standpoint about what do you do with all this debt when no amount of taxes seem to be able to counter the amount of spending that's uh, you know continuing from the from the government side? Yeah, but Michael, they have to pay for the stimulus somehow, right? I mean, they're 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 spending trillions trillions of dollars in stimulus. Where's that money coming from? Yeah, I mean, it depends on who you ask, right? It's funny because only three, four, or five years ago, you wouldn't have heard anybody talk about MMT, modern monetary theory. Uh, and it seems like now that's becoming more and more uh, accepted dogma, the idea that uh, debt doesn't matter because you can simply print uh, and it's, you know, it's left pocket, right pocket in terms of the Fed monetizing that debt. Now, the, we know what the real cost is. The real cost is, is inflation, right? Because the more spending there is in the system, the more distortions there are in terms of the cost of goods, the more distortions there are in terms of the wealth gap. Um, so, you know, and, and there's other implications, I think, from that. But, uh, you know, I, if we are at a juncture here in the system where suddenly MMT is uh, accepted, uh, I think there's a lot more damage coming uh, that we're all going to have to wrestle with in terms of the societal fabric that we're living in. Okay. 
I've, I've heard you talk uh, about this subject in another interview. You had said that the Fed has destroyed money as a store of value. What did you mean by that? Well, I, I would argue they, de they destroyed all stores of value. First of all, we have to define what store of value is. Yeah, I think please, a lot of people yeah. use that, right? So to me, store of value is something that simply keeps up with one's own personal inflation rate. Yes. Right? And I say personal inflation rate because the reality is the discussion on inflation deflation is nuanced, right? Because it depends yeah. on everybody's individual spending patterns. So it's got to be something which is relatively safe that in the event that you needed that capital, uh, at, because of a last minute uh, uh, life event that could be unforeseen, that you would not draw on that capital in a drawdown. Now, I would argue that CDs maybe were a store of value when they actually had yield certificates of deposit. Uh, gold certainly has been historically a store of value, but you know, obviously that seems to have been counter the last 10, 15 years or so, because it's really done nothing against uh, broader inflation. Right. Um, so, so what I would argue is that the Fed, because of their yield suppression and with the way that they just want to kind of jam risk into the system, they've made every single thing you can put your money into more of an investment or speculation and that stores of value really don't exist. And that just means that we're all living in a world where volatility is uh, sort of a part of our day-to-day -day, uh, asset uh, generation. Yeah, I, this, is an, this is an excellent point you brought up. I've had this thought and I've asked myself this question is that the concept of a store of value, we'll talk about the specific asset class you brought up, like gold, for example. The concept of a store of value is it, you need a store of value. The assumption there is predicated on the fact that we live in an inflationary environment. If we lived in Japan in the 90s, for example, where every year was seeing deflation, I've talked to Japanese people who lived through that time, and they're saying, well, I'd, I'd rather just save up because next year I know price is gonna go down. If that were the case, well, the best store of value is just your fiat currency, right? You put it under the mattress, that's gonna actually appreciate in value year over year. Isn't that right? Yeah, right, and that's always what's, what's interesting to me about the, uh, the negative rate argument, because you could have negative rates and still actually increase your purchasing power because you might be losing at a smaller pace than the cost of goods all around you, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real rate of return, even if you're negative and the cost of goods that you're buying are, are decreasing at another pace. So, so the, the, the store value part is, it's, in, it's not just semantics, right? I always make this point on, on Twitter and, and in the lead lag report itself that I, that I publish. You have to define things properly. If you're going to say something's a store value, the implication there is, well, then you can put 100% of your liquid net worth into that store value. But if that store value has a 40, 50, 60 percent drawdown, that's not really a store value. Right. And the definition there matters because it implies that how much you should wait in that particular thing that you're putting money into work uh, to work into. Yeah. OK, let's go back to uh, gold as a store of value. You said it hasn't really done anything for inflation over the last 10 to 15 years, right? Well, yeah, if you look at the gold price over the last 10 to 15, actually, if you look at the gold price compared to um, its peak in 2011, it actually has gone down. So over the last 10 year period, it's actually gone down. Of course, in 2012 to 2019, it's been flat. Why do you think people still consider it as a store of value against inflation? Well, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of narrative and history that, that would suggest that, right? Although there's a lot of other, I'm more of a quant, so I tend to look at macroeconomic variables much more than anything else. Gold, in reality, I think a lot of people view it incorrectly, maybe not historically, but incorrectly in the modern world in the sense that when you actually look at gold's price behavior, it's not my opinion, it doesn't really correlate to very much. It doesn't correlate to inflation, doesn't correlate to deflation, uh, doesn't even correlate to broader commodities on average, doesn't correlate to the S&P. Yeah. What gold does tend to correlate to is a volatility and risk in markets. Now, you could argue that, uh, because of that, gold is a fantastic diversifier, which I think is unequivocally true. Uh, it's very much you know, valid as a portfolio diversifier, something to allocate to, because at the end of the day, what diversification is having non-correlated assets mixed together. But I don't view gold necessarily as an inflation hedge, because again, if that were the case, the implication is it would be keeping up with inflation since 2011, to your point. So what is the ideal inflation hedge? Is there such a thing? Yeah, I, I don't. I have to. I don't think so. And I think this is the the what the Fed has created this this damage in terms of your opportunity set for what is a true store of value. The best thing one can do is have as much diversification of asset class and strategy as possible to smooth out the potential of needing that capital when you need it the most, right? Which yeah. is what you would really want in a store of value to not have that drawdown and sort of permanent loss of capital, getting money out at the at the wrong time for that. For that store value, so uh, you know it, it's hard to identify any single investment. Now, some people will argue Bitcoin's a store of value. I don't think so whatsoever. You can argue it's emerging as a store of value, maybe, right? But 
as Yogi Berra once said, predicting is hard, especially about the future. And nobody knows what's going to happen with Bitcoin or crypto. I don't care what anyone maximalist says. We all, you know, I always make this point. No amount of intelligence uh, increases the clarity of one's crystal ball. Right. So, you know, defining things matters from an investment thesis standpoint, again, just to figure out how to weight things properly. Yeah. So, Michael, if the Fed is creating inflation and thus devaluing the U.S. dollar, isn't the counter just to buy another currency? Wouldn't that just fix the problem? Well, I mean, it depends on how you define the problem. Right. Well, because the problem in this case, I'm defining it as um, based on what you said, the, the Fed is destroying assets. Uh, I, I'm assuming you mean particularly within the U.S. or globally, because if it's just U.S. based assets, right, the dollar is going to devalue. I would just buy yen or euro or literally anything else outside yeah, of no, the U.S. Yeah, well, I mean, right, and, that's, and that's a tricky thing with currencies, right, because obviously it's all relative from that perspective. And of course, right. if every central bank is mimicking the Fed in destroying their own currency, well, then it's whoever's better and more efficient at destroying their currency. Sure. And then you simply you know, bet on the other currency. Um, but, but, you know, there's other interesting kind of aspects to, you know, what I believe is the last great bubble, which is faith in the Fed uh, to kind of fix things and tr try to inflate out of all of this debt, which other countries are obviously uh, kind of on our coattails with. You know, with every single round of stimulus, you create more debt. With every single round of more debt, you have more deflation longer term. So it's like whenever somebody asks me, you know, do you believe the Fed is creating inflation or deflation? The answer is both. It's just a matter of which time frame, right? Because their answer to reflating out of debt is to encourage more debt, which is such a very perverse concept in and of itself. And it prevents, I think, broader discipline in the government in terms of where to allocate and spend the very taxpayer capital, which everyone is worried uh, will, will not be enough to pay off the debt that they're creating. Right. So th there's a lot of, I think, perverse things from a societal perspective. I've made this point. You've heard me say this before, David. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, th I think in many ways, the Fed has brought out the worst in humanity because in their desire to save capitalism with socialism, meaning socialized losses, widen the wealth gap. It's actually created a society, I think, where it's harder and harder to have actual debate, conversation and progress for the betterment of the average person as opposed to the one percent of one percent. Wow. That's very profound. It's going to take me a few minutes to digest what you just said, Michael. But uh, okay, let's talk about um, inflation created by the Fed. If it is indeed true that we're going to get higher, higher levels of inflation from what we've seen in the past year from stimulus, um, increases the money supply, and, uh, and the expansion of the Fed balance sheet, what will happen to interest rates? Won't the Fed be forced to raise interest rates? Yeah, so I think the most responsible thing for the Fed to do would be to hike rates, but we know they're not exactly responsible in terms of enforcing some discipline to make the cost of capital actually mean something, right? So there's a couple of things on the way that this is, this kind of surge in inflation expectations has, has occurred, and this goes back a little bit to signals. The fact that yields have spiked, everyone has said, well, that's going to break the stock market. That's not true. You want to see steepening in the yield curve because it means there's an increase in the demand for money. Sure. You don't want it to occur to the point where credit spreads widen, where junk debt is what gets hurt because now default risk premiums increase because they've got to roll over that debt at much higher costs of capital. So you don't see that just yet. Now, having said that, you know, there's a lot of talk about yield curve control. There's a lot of talk about, you know, maybe them hiking rates sooner than not. Not, I mean, we. I don't think there's really been any example historically where uh, the balance sheet of a central bank has ever gone the other way for any sustainable period of time. So even if they hike rates, the reality is they'll probably still do some degree of balance sheet expansion, which is effectively some degree of yield curve control. Um, and I think if, if, if the Fed hikes rates, that's actually not a bad thing. Uh, it's not a bad thing because think about what's happened here. You've had tremendous money going into assets. You've had no money going into income. The world is old. The world needs income producing assets, not riskier investments. Make the cost of capital mean something, let inflation expectations abate, and let's create some degree of flushing out of some of these zombie companies with hiking of rates so that finally the system becomes more efficient, at least right, somewhat. Okay. Yeah, so you're, you're saying it's not actually a bad thing. Economists would agree with you where we've been at the zero bound for too long. But if you increase the cost of capital, is the market ready for that? Would the market agree with you? You know, I think one, one, of, the, one of the things which I think the market is clamoring for here is the Fed to play a game of psychology. Okay, We know that the biggest problem the Fed has had is not the amount of dollars it pushes into the system. It's the velocity of money. It's the transactions that take place between two entities or two parties. How do you increase the velocity of money? 
it's a game of psychology. You have to make the marketplace think that rates are going to rise because if rates are going to rise, then you better take advantage of those low rates now. And that then creates a self-fulfilling growth cycle, right? So you've got to kind of create this expectation that what rates will rise so that people use more of those lower rates. Whereas if you have rates low for an extended period of time, people end up saying, well, there's no urgency. So, you know, in, in many ways, I think the market would welcome that because there's implications on the velocity of money. If there's a feeling that rates would rise, the thing is the Fed is apparently terrible at addressing psychology. All they're doing is simply going with the blunt tools of interest rates and looking at these classic economic models that don't work in reality when you factor in behavior. Okay, great. Let's circle back to your indicators now. Um, I want to talk about that. So I used to, before I joined Kiko, I used to work at a macro research firm. And I remember we used to have yellow indicators and a red flag. So the yellow flags would be uh, warning signs that the market's getting overheated and the red flags would be uh, risk off is imminent. So are we, are we in yellow? Are we in red right now? What are your, what are your signals? Yeah, I think it's more more yellow. So first of all, let's again define some of these terms, right? So risk sure. on, risk off. We, we yeah. know that the media often says risk on, risk off is uh, about direction. The market's up, uh, it's a risk on day. If the market's down, it's a risk off day. To me, risk on, risk off is not about direction. It's about changing volatility dynamics where average volatility in the stock market is likely to rise. Now, again, I published five white papers. They won five different awards. I've traveled the country. I've been to 47 states presenting on these papers at CFA chapters. And the, the indicators are all in some way, shape, or form predictive of risk because they're all in some way, shape, or form predictive of interest rates okay, and demand for capital. Now, the way that it's shaping out here is utilities, which are what are documented in the 2014 Dow award paper as a leading indicator, are strengthening against the market. Typically, utilities get ahead of major crashes, corrections, and bear markets. Why? Because they are the most bond-like sector of the stock market, and they benefit benefit from a decrease in the demand, uh, demand for money. The yield curve is still steepening, but it looks like that may finally be starting to abate. And then one of the indicators that I often write about in the lead lag report, and which I, I track in the ETF I run, Roro, is lumber to gold. So the 2015 Founders Award paper documents this anomaly whereby historically when lumber is outperforming gold as a relationship on a, in a very short term uh, very short term basis generally you see higher stock market volatility as well and most major same deal with utilities crashes corrections bear markets are preceded by weakness in lumber now a couple of weeks ago uh, lumber collapsed about 15 20% off of its highs still very strong from a longer term perspective but the fact that lumber seems to be weakening here, just as everyone is hyped up about uh, housing, and we just saw, by the way, housing data, which came in worse than expected, the fact that lumber may be starting to sense a slowdown in housing will cause some kind of risk in broader equities because the link there of lumber is to housing, and housing is the biggest driver of American consumer wealth. So I think that's something to really watch for. And that, by the way, probably does benefit gold. Uh, in the short to intermediate term as a flight to safety option if we are entering a high risk period for equities. Mm -hmm. All right, fantastic. Michael, let's follow up in a few weeks and see uh, see what happens with the markets. Should be a very interesting time going into the summer. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure, thank you. By the way, you said you went to 47 states. What are the, what are the states you haven't visited? Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota, and now I have to remember. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're going to make a trip anytime soon and cross those off your list. Yeah, exactly. I might have yeah. to. <laughs> thank you very much again, Michael. We'll speak, we'll speak again soon. And thank you thank for you. watching Kickle News. I'm David Lin.